Yeah. Since several years, I have received the press releases from Steinmeier of the Water Fuel Cell Corporation. When I was asked to invite some U.S. participants to this conference, Steinmeier came to my mind immediately. So I wrote him a personal letter, and I'm very, very happy that he came over. He has about 40 patents related to energy. He is one of the most brilliant inventors, and I want to make this introduction very short to give him more time to present his water fuel cell. Stadmeyer, please. Thank you. Uh, oh, I got a button here, right? You got a button? No, this is a microphone first. Yes. And there's a button. How do you, how do you turn it on? Slide projector on, Charlie. Testing two, three, four. Can you hear me? Before I uh, begin, I would like to uh, make a few little announcements. Number one, I, in 30 minutes, there's no way you can present the entire technology of the water fuel cell because it covers 40 major patents and some revolutionary new technology. If those are interested, we do release a publication on this. Please contact Ike, and he will give you the address uh, of our laboratories and water fuel cell. It's basically an overall view of our technology. It does not get into the full technical aspect of the technology. We have, over the years since 1975, have periodically released some of the information on news releases. And again, if you will contact Ike uh, and give him your name and address, we'll be more than happy to send you this information. Uh, also in the works, we are setting up a World International Energy Symposium in Sweden, where by which we will invite more than 140 nations of the world to come to see the demonstrations of the water fuel cell, te water fuel cell technology and its ramification and how this type of technology can be utilized in the world uh, energy market. Bear with me, I've got to learn how to use the slide projector. When you go home, I want you, if you will, look in the Bible on Job 38, verse 22 and 23. Back in 1975, I was very actively engaged in the retail and the truck parts, making over a million dollars a year profit. But when the U.S. experienced the oil, uh, the Arab oil embargo. Lower? Too loud? Slower. Uh-oh. I got a problem. <laughs> 30 minutes. 45. Okay. 45? Yes. Praise the Lord. Okay. Back in 1975, I was very actively engaged in the retailing and the truck parts making well over a million dollars a year profit. I'll try to go slower now. And when the Arabs threw the embargo on the United States, it alarmed me that a little country over in the Mideast could actually cripple the United States. Right now, based on the oil pressures in the existing fields of the world, whereby which the United States dropped an oil pressure from 1965 to 75, and where we're now dependent on 60% of foreign oil to maintain the industrial base of the United States, the same thing that had occurred in the United States is also now occurring in the Arab fields whereby which their oil pressure is dropping three times faster than it occurred in the United States. Go a little bit more slower, right? Okay. The same thing that has been occurring in the Arab oil fields and it had occurred in the United States Arab or the United States oil fields have also been occurring in the North Sea oil fields. And so therefore, back in 1975, it was imperative that we must come up with some form of alternate energy source if we are, if the economic base of the country is to survive. And you have been hearing many, many new principles of technology in the energy symposium. And now let's take some of the knowledge that has been presented to you and see if we can't come up with an apparatus capable of using water as a new fuel source, both for its application and utilization of gas energy as well as electrical energy. And I 
put the logo on there because the Lord had talked, or when he was talking to Job, asked him that it, if he had known anything about the characteristic and knowledge of water. So the Lord really specified that the knowledge of water would come out of time of great trouble. In the development of the water fuel cell technology, the main thrust was, number one, legalize its technology. Do not blow your ego because it was imperative that this technology would be protected for the world economic market. In order to bring in a new energy system into the country, it could not take one major or master patent to solve the energy problem. It had to take a myriad of many inventions integrated together to come up with a universal power system that could literally be utilized anywhere in the economy. In other words, what good would it be to develop a system that would provide home heating if, in fact, we could not get the cars and the trucks on the road moving, moving with a new fuel source? Or what good would it be if we would put the energy into industry, yet farmers would not have energy to process or to plow their lands and harvest their crops. And if we had no way, for an example, to apply an energy system to the military integrity base of the United States and other countries of the world, then we would have a tremendous problem. So the main thrust in development of water fuel cell technology was to hit every area of the economy and move in a bilateral movement in case and when the oil shortages start to hit. We live in a very unsecured times, very shortly you will see tremendous vexation of lack of energy and the lack of energy supplies. In my files back home in my laboratories, I have the most scientific compilation study on a hydrogen that has ever come out of the scientific world through NASA, where the, ten, the United States government spent more than $10 million to tell me that hydrogen was the most advanced, the best or ideal fuel source that could be used and brought into the economy very quickly. But in the report specified that there was three major areas that had to be addressed. Number one, be able to produce the hydrogen gas economically, control the rate of its production, adjust the burn rate of hydrogen gas to co-equal that of the fossil fuels, and I added a fourth one, the ability to transport the hydrogen gas without spark ignition. And of course, I own all the patent rights, both nationally and internationally, on this technology. Not only have I been filing the patents on its base technology, but I've also been filing patents on the related technology, give me a technological buffer zone to bring the technology into the world market area. Some of the major arguments that I had used in the United States in releasing that this technology was, gentlemen, number one, what happens if a foreign power can come in your land and use your own existing laws to block this technology from coming in in existence? And of course, presidential executive action came into being to guarantee the processing of patents, not only for the United States, but even for the world. Next argument was, gentlemen, if you have not an economy, you will not have a government. If you do not have a government, you will not have a military. So it's the same type of arguments that I have been using in negotiating with many leaders throughout the world. The red zone signifies the development of the hydrogen to be able to utilize as a fuel source and render it safer than that of natural gas and as a result use the water fuel cell technology as a retrofit energy system. It was paramount that in fact that this technology would have to be applied to existing energy consuming devices like that of your cars, your trucks. We do not have time nor the energy nor the, the monies to be able to convert the cars and the trucks over to new power systems. It has to be a way that we can use a fuel source that we can very readily get ourselves available to, and water seems to be the most abundant fuel source on the face of this earth if we can be able to release that energy from water economically. The first thing that was confronting was the fact is how in the world couldn't we be able to switch off the covalent bonding of the water molecule without con consuming a tremendous amount of electrical power as opposed to the electrolysis process that we all know. What we addressed was number one, Slow down, okay. First thing that we were considering. He's right. It goes at 3.30. No. First thing we considered was how in the world can you naturally be able to switch off the covalent bonding of the water molecule without consuming a tremendous amount of electrical energy. So when we looked at the water molecule, we realized that when the Hydrogen atoms unite with the oxygen atoms under the law of physics, something's got to happen. And when the oxygen atom accepts the hydrogen electrons, then you develop an electrical imbalance 
by which you now have eight protons as opposed to 10 electrons, so therefore the oxygen atom takes on a negative electrical charge. Since the hydrogen atom is now sharing its electron, and since its proton is positive electrically charged, then the hydrogen atoms will take on positive electrical charges. Therefore, the atoms of the water molecule is being held together by an electrical attraction force. It's quite obvious then that if you would now expose the water molecule to an external electrical voltage force, then you would, should and would and can actually separate the water molecule by a physical force through an electrical attraction as Coulomb and Newlam has stated clearly as that you can use voltage and electronic circuit to perform work. We also realize that as you will expose the water molecule to a high pulse voltage frequency and as you raise the voltage amplitude, we now can take the water molecule into the liquid to gas ionization state. In the process, we restrict the amps and allow voltage to take over. At the same time that we are exposing the water molecule to an external electrical force of opposite polarity to perform the work of splitting the water molecule, since water is a dielectric liquid, okay. that's almost impossible. Natural water is a dielectric liquid, and as such, when you expose the water to a high pulse voltage frequency, the water will actually take on an electrical charge. So at the same time that we are spl splitting the water molecule by now allowing the water molecule to elongate and change the time share rate of its electron, as the water takes on the electrical charges, then the hydrogen electrical charge, positive electrical charges will increase at the same time that the negative electrical charge of the oxygen atom will increase. And as a result, the negative charge electron, which is its covalent electron, is now being attracted to the positive charge hydrogen atom. And since the oxygen atom has a negative electrically charged, a repelling action occurs, and therefore we are now switching off the covalent bonding of the water molecule, and therefore satisfying the first major requirement of NASA, being able to release hydrogen gas from ordinary natural water and do it economically. This was one of the apparatuses which we had shown under 101 in the United States Patent Office and the World Patent Office that come in and show operability. If you show operability, you receive your patents. The water fuel cell technology is 180 degrees out of phase of the electrolysis process. We set up an environment. So, can we please uh, the light etwas dunkler machen, bitte? Then can we see the dias better. Thank you. We set up a non-chemical environment. The materials that we're using to set up the voltage field is ordinary stainless steel 304 material, which does not, it's chemically inert to liberated hydrogen and oxygen atoms liberated in water exposed to a high voltage field. You add no chemicals into the process. In order to do this, I now had to invent a new form of electronic circuit, which we call the voltage intensifier circuit. And since water is a dielectric liquid, liquid, and if you put it between two voltage plates, you now form a capacitor. And every electronic man knows that if you would put a coil in series to a capacitor, you now develop what's called a resonant charging choke. And so we're now putting two coils on opposite side of the capacitor, and we are now forming a pulse frequency circuit by which you will now once hit the resonant frequency of water, of natural water, amp flow drops down to a minimum, allowing voltage to take off to affinity if the electronic components will allow that to take place. Basically what we're doing in the pulsing circuit is that as the pulsing circuit enters into the resonant charging choke, it creates the electromagnetic field which now restricts amp flow to allow voltage to perform its work. Now in physics we know, and have known for a long time, that voltage does, in fact, perform work. But heretofore, no one ever dreamed of using this technology in reference of using and uh, liberating hydrogen and economically from water. So we're now restricting the amp flow and allow voltage to take over. We had found out that once you restrict the amps and allow voltage amplitude to be increased, hydrogen gas was being generated on an exponential function. Okay. 
Okay. Those who are electronic engineers, you know that there are two aspects to electrical power. There are amps and there are voltage. The only time you consume the electrical power is you consume it in the form of amps. If you were to restrict the amp flow, you have voltage left over. Voltage is a form of potential energy. It is not consumed energy. And as a result, we're now using potential energy to perform work. Yeah. Yeah. We had found out that the electrical polarization process occurs in all forms of natural water even including the most purest form of distilled water. Once we realize the fu fundamental operational characteristics and parameters of the electrical polarization process, we now raise the voltage amplitude by which we now take the water into the liquid to gas ionization state. As we take it into the liquid to gas ionization state, the voltage potential is now ejecting or pulling away the electrons from the combustible gas atoms. We had found out that when you attenuate voltage amplitude in reference to false frequency, you will hit the phenomena of resonant action by which you are producing a tremendous quantum leap in hydrogen generation over the prior art. We also found out that once you hit resonance, and subject it to the stimulation of the pulse voltage and then switch it off, then the hydrogen will continually be produced on the power off put stage. Example being that once you hit a resonance, we could excite it for five seconds and you're producing gas for 94 seconds. You divide five into 94, we were producing gas, hydrogen gas, 19 times more on the power off put stage than on the power input stage. We also realize that if you will leave the pulse voltage frequency continuously or constant and don't touch the apparatus, hydrogen gas is now being produced on a geometrical configuration and will continue to increase in production of a hydrogen gas until such extent that you would reach the maximum flow rate of water going into the resonant cavity. So we now have another form of control of regulating hydrogen gas production these operational parameters now satisfy the second major requirement of NASA to use hydrogen as a fuel source, that we can control the hydrogen and gas on demand. We are now starting to aid the electrical polarization process by injecting laser energy into the system. And by doing so, we are now causing even a faster and a greater rate of hydrogen production to occur, as you see right here. But we are also doing something else. We want to take the combustible gas atoms even to a higher energy state. This is an example of a laser injection resonant cavities. Those cavities themselves like to be extremely small since they're taken on a form of a capacitor. We use solid state lasers in injection of photon energy into the process. Those in electronics, they are simple little LEDs, light emitting diodes, but they will produce a, a coherent light we don't need a large light intensity to accomplish the task. We don't want to focus the energy down to a concentrated point. We want to allow the light or the photon energy to be absorbed by those liberated combustible gas atoms. There's an example of what happens when you subject water molecules to a high pulse voltage frequency and allowing the laser uh, pulse frequency to be superimposed within the process. As we started to do our experimentation, we had realized that there were many phenomena that were occurring in order to bring about the results of using hydrogen as a fuel source, going from the random state to the alignment to the polarization to the molecular elongation to the liquid to gas ionization state, but we are also going down to the atomic destabilization of the water molecule. This is an example now of a vertical array resonant cavity stacked together and as the lower resonant cavity releases its electrically charged combustible gas atoms, it is now injected into the second cavity which increases the process and eventually will now allow a tremendous amount of hydrogen gas to be produced at the top. Examples that you can subject it to 110 volt pulse frequency and yet 
you are now compounding the increase of voltage equivalent to 1,000 volts in the upper resonant cavity. There's an example of a three-tier resonant cavity configuration. Now, once we had found out that we can use hydrogen as a fuel source and release it and control its rate of production, hydrogen is extremely volatile, as we all know. If you ignite it with ambient air, it burns around 325 centimeters per second. The blue zone signifies the ability of rendering hydrogen safer than that of natural gas. This is the number one area that gave us the ability to retrofit hydrogen to any existing energy consuming device and do it economically because if I can adjust the hydrogen burn rate to co-equal fossil fuels, then it is not needed for me, for an example, to change the design configuration of an internal combustion engine but also had to comply with both the federal and state and local highway safety code regulations to render this type of fuel cell safer than water. We address the phenomena of natural water, that water is like a sponge, it will absorb ambient air. Those who have gone fishing knows that if you look at a gill of a fish, the gill of the fish simply agitates the water molecule to release the dissolved air. When you light a match, the question being is, why does not the air burn up because the bulk of ambient air is composed of non-combustible gases or gases that do not support the burning process. Likewise, the fuel cell is a multi-gas generator. It is also releasing ambient air which is absorbed by the water. As a result of this multi-gas being released, we automatically can adjust the burn rate of hydrogen gas from 325 centimeters a second down to around 47 centimeters a second, co-equaling that of natural gas. Please the count pull up. I'm going to have to talk to my mother and say, hey, Mom. <laughs> this is an example of now sustaining and maintaining a hydrogen gas flame from ordinary natural water. The flame is burning around 47 centimeters a second. In the prior state of the art, that was totally, absolutely impossible. Normally, when you burn hydrogen and oxygen, you cannot see it, nor smell it, nor taste it, because it's a very clean burning fuel. You'll see a small portion of the flame. That's actually being projected around nine inches in height. The flame temperatures we have achieved from 5,000 up to over 20,000 degrees temperature. The question now being asked that we can sustain high temperatures to melt steel. And but yet, why does it not spark back into the generator? In all probability, if NASA had had this technology, our astronauts would have not died in vain. But I was developing the technology when the accident actually had occurred. And of course, I could tell you some very interesting happenings of events, like blowing a hole in the living room floor. And, and I always believe in a moment of adversity, there's something to learn. And so I knew I had to come up with a fail-safe fuel cell if it was going to be a viable energy system to put in the, into the economy. So the quenching circuit technology was developed. And what we had found out is that as you put the fuel gases through a small little tubular passageway, somewhere along the line, the non-combustible gases that do not support the burning process will act as a blockage to prevent the hydrogen and oxygen atoms to come together to cause gas ignition. And therefore, we had come up with a very simple way of an anti-sparkback device <coughs> that was not dependent either on gas pressure or gas volume. In other words, anti-sparkback or to prevent a sparkback into the fuel cell now was 100%. As you see the small little holes in the center of a disc, they form the quenching circuit. The disc itself is made out of aluminum material. The reason why we used it is because we do not want the whole size to be elongated and ceramic materials were extremely ideal to prevent oxidation from occurring when the liberated hydrogen atoms would go through other materials such as brass or steel. We took that technology and extended it to form a quenching tube by which we now can transport the hydrogen and oxygen gas. We can literally burn it, send a tracer bullet through it and you will not ignite the gases going back into the fuel cell this solved the next major requirement of NASA being able to transport the hydrogen gas without spark ignition. 
This is an example of adjusting the burn rate of hydrogen gas. Irregardless of whoever comes up with a hydrogen generator, they're going to have to go through our patents. To give you a classical example of this, in a tube, if I would put hydrogen and ambient air in it and ignite it at one end, it would travel 325 centimeters a second. Now, everybody knows about styrometrics configuration. When I filed the patents in the United States Patent Office, they came back and said, Stan, we don't know what you're talking about, the adjustment of the burn rate of hydrogen gas. We understand styrometrics. I said, well, if I illustrate it to you, will you give him your, will you allow the patents? said, absolutely. So we found out that hydrogen with ambient air will burn at 325 uh, centimeters per second. We took natural gas as an example and put it in the same condition and sparked it, and we found out that it would burn around 42 centimeters a second. So it became very obvious that if I would mix non-combustible gases with the hydrogen and oxygen gases coming out of the fuel cell, I would use the non-combustible gas as a modulator to regulate the speed by which the oxygen atom would unite to the hydrogen atom, and as a result, now have the ability to adjust the hydrogen burn rate to co-equal that of all of the fossil fuels, and I can adjust the hydrogen burn rate down to that of burning leaves or papers. That gave me now the economics of being able to retrofit the fuel cell to any existing energy consuming device in the economy. As a businessman, I am also a research development engineer. You will see a videotape showing uh, seeing a dune buggy running on water. I knew that I had to comply with the law of economics, and the law of economics strictly means that the guy who comes up with the most economical way is going to win out. There are a lot of Cadillac ideas that come into existence, but they do not get out in the marketplace basically because they violate the law of economics. So the development of the technology was being developed under the premise, keep it simple, use the KISS method, keep it simple, stupid. Anyone ever heard of that? If you keep it simple, you can get the economics down. Now we found out that as we were processing the gas, we were producing tremendous high temperature flames. But yet I was confronted with that if I would put the fuel cell and hook it up to a stove, the wise would get really kind of irritated and mad at us that when they come back and said, look, you burn holes in our pots and pans. So the next step was how can you adjust the burn rate to go from 5,000 degrees temperatures down to 200 or 300 degrees and do it under the law of economics. And so it was very obvious that the gases coming out of the fuel cell that we could recapture those gases going through the flame, recycling back into the flame or back into the generator. And as a result of this, by regulating its flow rate, we now can adjust the burn rate of hydrogen gas to any temperature levels we so desire. Now, since I'm using the gases coming off the flame, does it cost them anything? El Zippo, other than the apparatus itself. Now we were confronting that in the prior technology that they were changing the design of the engine and the compression strokes and trying to use very exotic materials. The key was that we need the cars to run and the trucks. So how do we run an internal combustion engine? As an engineer, you will look at this in three ways. Number one, the engine is a mechanical drive device. Secondly, it's an air pump. It will pump air through the carburetor and send it out the exhaust. Thirdly, you look at an internal combustion engine that it is a manufacturer of non-combustible gases. So we now simply take the gases that's gone through the burning processes that has eliminated the burning product in the fuel and also eliminated the oxygen atom and as a result now metered mix back into the fuel cell and we're now automatically adjusting the burn rate of that hydrogen gas to co-equal that of gasoline or diesel fuel, and as a result, you do not have to change any of the design characteristics on an existing engine. You will see on the videotape very shortly this dune buggy actually running off water. It was syndicated three years ago on ABC's uh, news. It came down and literally videotaped it for three hours to know that it was running on water, and it had gone all over the world. This is what I call the boilerplate configuration which was used to obtain all of our patents nationally and internationally. We have now taken the technology to the point of being able to transport the hydrogen gas through conventional gas grid system. Prior art dictated that you would cool the hydrogen down to around 400 and some degrees and put it under pressure and transport it down the road by trucks. 
This type of technology now gives us the ability that we could transport the hydrogen gas through existing gas grid systems without even changing one piece of hardware. We simply are now taking the ambient air, which is one of the cheapest commodities on Earth, exposing it to a flame to produce the non-combustible gases that are now mixing with the hydrogen gas, and as a result, we can adjust the hydrogen burn rate to that of natural gas or even adjust it lower, and therefore we now have a very safe way of transporting the hydrogen gas that over exceeds the prior art of the technology. Now we come to the point that as we know, you burn hydrogen and oxygen, the byproduct is water. And so therefore we want to use and recapture the water and recycle it back into the generator. So inherently the fuel cell is a fantastic water pur purification device. To accomplish this, we now use the old method of the gas-fired refrigerators as you probably have known when you were young. Where you take a flame and heat a gas and as you circulate the heated gas to go through a gas expansion chamber, then as the gases will expand, you'll have a cooling effect. So the heated gas, the superheated gases coming off the hydrogen flame now was condensed down and cooled back in the water vapor. And since the electrical polarization pulls apart the water molecule by a physical force, any contaminants in water remains in the fuel cell. And as a result, if there is any bacteria that leaves the water and attaches itself to the liberated gases, cannot and does not live through an exposure of a 5,000 degree flame. So inherently, the characteristic of the fuel cell now gives us the ability to purify water and even go into desalination of salt water and do it in a way that we do not use any chemicals or filtration of any sort. In order to comply and ensure that we have a system that does not produce nitrous oxide, which would be minuscule in application, we now expose it to a catalytic block allowing the, hemis allowing the design of the hemisphere itself to re redirect any gases back into the flame that may escape the combustion process and as a result we have a way of converting 100 percent of the gases coming out of the fuel cell. Now, this is an example that we've designed it also to comply with Murphy's Law. Any of you have, de have done any development, you know Murphy gets in the way. So in order to prevent the leakage of hydrogen gas, we now are adjusting the quenching circuit in a way that if, one, if you have a blowout, then the adjoining flame will reignite the gases coming out of the fuel cell. Now as we know that as you burn hydrogen and oxygen gases from water and you will burn it, we know that in the gas combustion process, you will release energy, thermal explosive energy, up to two and a half times that of gasoline. But there is a phenomenal amount of energy in water if you can be able to tap into it. Einstein suggested it, that there was enough energy in water that you could literally take a train of a thousand car train around the earth many, many, many times if you can tap into the process. Now we all know what happened to the nuclear industry. I was in Washington, D.C. in 1965 when they were trying to come up with a fail-safe nuclear power system. Three days in a meeting I got up and said, gentlemen, everything you have said in this meeting is a bunch of malarkey because as you subject the radiation to our materials, you will have the hourglass effect and unfortunately Three Mile Island occurred uh, within that time that I had prophesied back in 1965. But can we now be able to tap in, into an even greater source of energy? You know when the Arabs threw the embargo on the United States, it alarmed me that in fact that if we would not get our cars and trucks on the roads again and start moving very quickly, the food supply chain in the United States was 27 days. When I made technical presentation to G General Bouchard at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and General Abramson in the, in the Pentagon, I said, gentlemen, I want to remind you that in fact that during the Arab embargo, you only had two and a half days of aviation fuel to fight a war. And I don't care how sophisticated aircraft you have on the runway, if you have no way of powering that jet, it's a piece of junk. Now, you know and I know the generals don't like to have their equipment be called a piece of junk. So it's very important that we bring a new technology into the economies of the world. We also have to be able to protect the military base of the United States. So as we liberated the gases from water, we are now resubjecting those liberated gases to even a higher pulse voltage frequency. We are restricting the amps and our voltage to take over to perform its work. 
We are now injecting laser energy in the process to aid the ejection of the electrons. 3.30. Well, we'll go on. Yeah, we'll go on. Okay. Yeah. So basically what I'm doing now is that I am now taking the combustible gas ions and I'm now bringing it into subcritical state. I pulled off the electrons. I have now subjected to photon energy. And what I'm now doing is taking combustible gas atoms and putting them into subcritical state. In order to do this, I had to invent now the electron extraction circuit. When I developed the electron extraction circuit, which I shut off the flow of amps on voltage to take over to eject the electrons, I now come up with an alternate way of redirecting those liberated negative electrons. And as a result, if you would apply the B plus across a filament of a light bulb, then those negative charge electrons will go into the filament and to react to produce heat in the form of light energy. But what I'm now illustrating to you that not only are we setting up the condition to bring about the hydrogen fracturing process, we are now producing electrical energy simultaneously, which that electrical energy now can be recycled back in electronic circuits to aid the voltage intensifier circuit to perform the electrical polarization process. This is an example now that when you inject the combustible gas atoms to laser energy, it causes the electrons to go to a higher energy state which now allows electrons to be ejected from the oxygen atom as an example. And by subjecting it to the pulse voltage frequency, we pull away the electrons and then we consume the electrons and not allow the electrons to go back into the process. So we are now keeping the combustible gas atoms into a very critical state. To do this, we now develop what is called the hydrogen gas gun technology. Now, Basically, what we are doing is we know that, in fact, that when you ignite hydrogen and oxygen gases, it will release the thermal explosive energy up to two and a half times that of gasoline. The scientific question that was to be asked at this particular point is that what happens during thermal gas ignition of hydrogen if you could prevent the formation of the water molecule from occurring? In other words, if you could prevent the formation of the water molecule from occurring, and could not reach stable state, then in fact you, that explosive energy would keep continuing to be released from the process until such time either a new atom structure is formed or that an implosion effect and release pure energy. Now since the energy problem has been occurring in the scientific world, uh, Livermore Laboratories has been trying to use a hydrogen fusion, as you know, by taking hydrogen and subjecting it to high temperatures and high pressures around 10 million degrees and putting it in an electro electromagnetic bottle and trying to release its energy. Another process which was very successfully demonstrated in the university environment is called the muon process. Now we know that if you will decrease the mass of an atom, it must release its energy. And under the muon process, they took a muon, which is twice the size of an electron, and caused the hydrogen atom to accept the muon and reject its natural electron. Now once that has occurred, then decay comes about on the muon, and once the muon decays, then the hydrogen atom no longer stays in, a, in existence, and the energy that's there to hold the electron in its outer orbit is no longer there, and therefore under the law of physics, everything must be stabilized and therefore releases tremendous amounts of energy. What we are now doing is setting a subcritical mass of combustible gas atoms, decreasing its mass size, and allowing and preventing the formation of the water molecule from occurring to release phenomenal amount of energy. Now, this is an example of taking a hydrogen gas gun and putting it on top of the resin cavity. Matter of fact, the hydrogen gas gun can be reduced down to the size of a spark plug or the gas injector system of an F-15 or an F-18 and literally fly an F-18 or a 15 on the atomic power of water. This is some of the electronic circuit interfacing that gave us the patents worldwide on this technology. Now to give you an example of the hydrogen fracturing process to prevent the formation of the water molecule is that Ike and I are on a basketball court 
and he's the hydrogen atom and I'm the big oxygen atom. Now I'm eight times bigger than he is, right? Now what I've done is I've zapped Ike with laser energy. And because I had hit him with laser energy, his electron migrates farther away from the nucleus. And as a result of that, the electrical attraction force between that electron and nucleus becomes weakened. So he is now in a weakened state. But I am the big oxygen atom and I got four missing electrons and then the law of physics says I want to stabilize and I need some electrons. But I'm also injected with laser energy and I'm in a highly energized state and that'll ener absorb laser energy and the nucleus is preventing me from allowing me to go back to stable state. So I have an abnormal state, I'm in a subcritical state and then I am being subjected to thermal ignition and so as a result, the hydrogen oxide atom seeks to come together to form the water molecule, but it is not in stable state. And as a result of that, an avalanche effect occurs, and once that takes place and stabilization cannot occur, you start to release thermal explosive energy of a fantastic magnitude. This process in the hydrogen fracturing process, the potential yield is 2.5 million barrels of oil per gallon of water. And since there is no neutron interreaction in the process, it is a very clean process. So we now have the abilities to retrofit the technology to any form of aircraft you so desire, even rocket engines. We can take even the liquid hydrogen and the liquid oxygen subjected to the hydrogen fracturing process and obtained tremendous Mach yields where the United States was originally developing a hydrogen powered aircraft to go Mach 25. It is now slated to go Mach 150 in outer space with this type of technology. We now found since voltage stimulates the process we could not rely on prior generators to give us the economics of reliability to operate both under the seas as well as in space. So all of these electrical generators and the type of technology had to be developed to give us the form of economics. I would tell many people in our presentation that the Lord had given me a phenomenal electrical generator. Here are the following characteristics. It has only one moving part that never wears out. It has no bearings. It has no contact brushes. I can give you single or three-phase or multi-phase power output, and if that don't bother you, I can drop it in the bucket of water and it will never short out. Now, they would start to laugh at me, but once I start showing the technology, they stop laughing. Now, anytime you can get three-star generals out of their chairs in 10 minutes in the Pentagon, you're doing something, right? So in order to overcome the opposing electrical, the opposing Magnetic fields are associated with rotary electrical generators. The EPG system technology was developed. Basically, the technology centered around. Seven minutes past. Huh? It's already seven minutes past. Okay, how far you want me to go? <laughs> Hurry up. Yeah. Okay. You said you